Southeast Asian countries have always been sandwiched between the U.S. and China. The Philippines previously adopted a strategy of relying on the U.S. for national security and being closely tied to China for economic development. As the competition between the U.S. and China heats up and the situation in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea become tense, the Philippines has reached a moment of choice. Last May, Marcos Jr. was elected president. Now he has clearly stated his position. Now there's an additional, uh, there's an additional uh, aspect to it, and that is whilst the tensions across in the across Taiwan Strait, across the Taiwan Straits, uh, seem to be continuing to increase, then the safety of our Filipino nationals in Taiwan becomes of primordial importance. And so that uh, these EDCA sites will also prove to be useful for us uh, should that uh, terrible occurrence uh, come about. And so, again, it's all in a def we have a very defensive posture. That, uh, that, that is, uh, that is the Philippines, surrounded by the sea, is located at the southern end of the first island chain and is at the forefront of confronting the Chinese communist threat of force in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. The ability of the U.S. military to access Philippine military facilities is a key variable in military emergencies in the Western Pacific. On April 3rd, Manila and Washington agreed to resume joint patrols in the South China Sea and reached an agreement to allow U.S. troops to access four Philippine military bases. Previously, on February 2nd, the U.S. and the Philippines reached an agreement to open four military bases to the U.S., including some islands in the Bashi Channel. Bosco Island is the closest to Taiwan, roughly 172 kilometers away, and is home to the Philippine Marine Corps. The Philippines has deployed BrahMos supersonic anti-shipping missiles there to effectively deter the Chinese fleet from crossing the strait. This brings the number of Philippine military bases to almost double the number required by the U.S.-Philippine Defense Agreement. The total number of bases open to the U.S. military is now nine. From April 11th to 28th, 2023, the U.S. and the Philippines conducted their largest shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder military exercise. Part of it was held on Basco Island, a sign that the U.S. is targeting the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The Bosco and other islands off the northern coast of the Philippines could be the staging ground for any U.S. military response to the Taiwan conflict. The U.S. ambassador to the Philippines accompanied Marcus Jr. to observe the live firing that sank a decommissioned warship. Seeing that the Philippines is gradually leaning on the U.S., on April 21, 2023, Chinese Foreign Minister Ching Gong visited the Philippines, seemingly an effort to pull in the Philippine government quickly. But the strange thing is that before the Chinese Foreign Minister left, the CCP once again created conflicts in the disputed area of the Second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea. Before that, on February 6th, a laser incident occurred near the same space. On April 23rd, the Philippine Coast Guard was patrolling near the area. It was blocked by a Chinese Coast Guard ship, resulting in a near terrifying collision. The Philippine Coast Guard said in a statement that the aggressive behavior of the two Chinese vessels posed a significant threat to the safety of the Philippine vessels and their crews. One of the Chinese vessels made a dangerous maneuver about 150 feet from a Philippine vessel. China Coast Guard 5201. This is Philippine Coast Guard vessel. BRP Malapascua. MRRB 4403. Conducting lawful routine maritime patrol within the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. In accordance with international and Philippine national laws, we are proceeding according to our plan goal. You are reminded that China is a party of United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, that the Union shows falls within the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. Request to stay clear from our passage in accordance with the Commission regulation. Over. Firstly, Yen'ai Reef is part of China's Spratly Islands. On April 23rd, two Philippine Coast Guard vessels trespassed into the waters of Yen'ai Reef without China's permission and deliberately took provocative actions to close in on Chinese maritime 
law enforcement vessels. The Chinese maritime law enforcement vessels acted in accordance with the law to safeguard China's territorial sovereignty and maritime order, while taking timely measures to avoid the dangerous approach of the Philippine vessels and avoiding collisions. The operation was professional and restrained. On the day of April 23rd, the Philippine Coast Guard was joined on patrol by foreign journalists from the Associated Press and AFP. They saw firsthand the bullying behavior of the Chinese Communist Party on this strategic waterway. It should be emphasized that the Philippine vessels carrying journalists rushing into the waters of Renai Reef is a premeditated provocation that deliberately seeks to pick a fight and use the opportunity to make hype. China expresses its solemn protest and strong dissatisfaction in this regard and urges the Philippines to respect China's territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests in the South China Sea and to stop taking actions that will complicate the situation. We suspect that the CCP is playing a psychological war with the Philippines. So what if you have the support of the U.S.? I'll deal with you just the same. Do you have the ability to request the U.S. to intervene? Even if you did, would the U.S. really step in? In 1951, the U.S. and the Philippines signed a mutual defense treaty and became military allies. However, the scope of the U.S. defense commitment remains strategically vague. This has left the new Philippine government feeling insecure. On May 1st, Marcus Jr. visited the White House. He was the first Philippine president to visit the White House in nearly 11 years. Uh, in, the, in the difficult times that we are facing ahead of us, uh, uh, we need to find uh, many ways to uh, strengthen our alliances and our partnerships uh, in the face of the, the new economy that we are facing post-pandemic. Um, beyond that, there, is, there are also the uh, uh, issues, geopolitical issues, that have made the region where the Philippines is uh, possibly, arguably, the most uh, complicated geopolitical situation in, in the world right now. And so it is only natural that uh, for the Philippines to look to its uh, sole treaty partner uh, in the world uh, to strengthen and to redefine uh, the relationship that we have and the roles that we play in the face uh, of uh, those rising tensions that we see now uh, around the South China Sea and uh, Asia Pacific and Indo-Pacific region. So I welcome very much the opportunity uh, to come here uh, to visit with you in the White House and to discuss all these terribly important issues. In the White House, Marcus Jr. got a clear commitment from the U.S. to provide the Philippines with security. President Biden told Marcus Jr. that the defense commitment to the Philippines is ironclad. On May 3rd, the U.S. and Philippines released their first-ever bilateral defense guidelines which examines threats in various areas and the forms of response. It specifically mentions attacks in the disputed South China Sea, including attacks against the Philippine Coast Guard. On the same day, Defense Secretary Austin hosted a full military salute for Marcus Jr. at the Pentagon Parade Ground. This is the first time during the Biden administration that a foreign head of state was greeted at the Pentagon with a full military salute. The U.S. has gone to great lengths to address the Philippines' lack of trust in the U.S. As President Biden has made clear, our commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. And let me say once again that our mutual defense treaty applies to armed attacks on our armed forces, Coast Guard vessels, public vessels, or aircraft in the Pacific, including anywhere in the South China Sea. So make no mistake, Mr. President, we will always have your back in the South China Sea or elsewhere in the region. And, uh, the as early as the Trump administration in 2019, then-Secretary of State Mike Pompeo promised for the first time that the U.S. would protect the Philippines in accordance with its mutual defense obligations under Article 4 of the U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty in the event of an armed attack on Philippine forces, aircraft, or vessels in the South China Sea. The U.S. has reiterated this commitment since then until the release of the U.S.-Philippines Bilateral Defense Guidelines. 
It's clear that the U.S. is trying to gain back the trust of the Philippines in various ways. The Philippines is strategically positioned as the latest piece of the democratic counterweight to the CCP and the southernmost piece of the puzzle. After Korea in the north has confirmed its position on the U.S. side together with Japan and Taiwan and now with the Philippines in the far south, a crescent-shaped encirclement network has been formed, which is the most important defense line to contain the military expansion of the CCP. The U.S. defense of the first island chain is not only to protect Taiwan, but also to protect its allies and even the U.S. itself. It can be said that the defense of the first island chain is a defense of democracy and civilization. So what is the driving force behind the Philippine government's sudden turnabout? The fact is that the CCP has been pushing the Philippines away for the past few decades. It has used the Nine Dash Line to claim sovereignty over almost the entire South China Sea, which in some places overlaps with the exclusive economic zones of Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia, sparking controversy. In addition, Brunei, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Vietnam also have sovereignty over the Spratly Islands, where China has dug sand and built reefs and equipped them with missiles and runways. On July 12, 2016, the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that there was no legal basis for the CCP's claim to the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. Still, over the years, the Communist Party has deployed hundreds of coast guards and fishing boats to the disputed area. I, as I explained to President Xi, it is the first year. Uh, last year was the first year in the history entire history of the Philippines where we had to import fish, which is a ridiculous situation for a country that consists of 7,100 plus islands. And these are areas that uh, we have, that, uh, have been fished by our fishermen and our fisher folk uh, for 20, 30 generations. And they cannot understand why they are not, not allowed to fish there, why they are being blockaded away from there. And that is one of the main points. I said, uh, I, as I spoke to President Xi, I told President Xi, I said, we are not going to decide the conflicts that we have in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of these uh, territorial, in terms of territoriality. But perhaps we can take the little step, which is a little step, of allowing once again our fishermen to, to uh, apply their trade. The CCP continues to change the status quo in the South China Sea in extreme ways. For example, in 2012, the Huangyan Island incident broke out between China and the Philippines, and the CCP took effective control of Huangyang Island. Since 2013, it has been militarizing the South China Sea with large-scale reclamation of the sea, planting islands, and has constructed a large triangular military system and a small triangular military system in the Spratly Islands. Now, the Filipino government has decided to respond in a clear manner. The Philippine Coast Guard said that between May 10th and 12th, five Bowies flying the Philippine flag were set up in five areas within a 322-kilometer zone, including the Whitsun Reef, where hundreds of Chinese maritime vessels were berthed in 2021. Uh, pinapakita natin, uh, inaassert natin yung ating sovereignty. And at the same time, we are adhering to the to the international statutes or law na kailangan ipakita natin based on UNCLOS yung ating entitlement ay pinoprotekta natin. And at the same time, para naman mabigyan ng kaligtasan, proteksyon yung mga naglalayag at maging ito ay isang marka at malaman nila kung saan yung mga peligroso at safe na pwedeng daanan ng mga uh, even civilian ship. The Philippines, like many other Asian countries, once wanted to be economically dependent on China. This illusion was exploited by the Beijing authorities. Over the years, the Philippines has not really gained the assumed benefits, but has been trapped to some extent. This can be seen in the following three aspects. First, since 2017, China has become the Philippines' largest trading partner and is now the Philippines' top country of import and second largest export market. However, the Philippines suffers from a huge deficit. For example, in 2022, the bilateral trade volume was U.S. 87.72 billion, and the Chinese surplus was U.S. 41.63 billion. 
The second thing is that the Philippines has become somewhat dependent on China for its foreign trade. For example, in 2021, according to the Philippines Department of Trade and Industry Statistics, the total trade between the two countries reached US$38.34 billion, accounting for 19.9% of the Philippines' total foreign trade. The Philippines imported US$26.79 billion from China, accounting for 22.7% of its total imports. And it exported US$11.55 billion to China, accounting for 15.5% of the total exports. In 2021, China's foreign trade already exceeded US$6 trillion. In comparison, this trade between the Philippines and China is insignificant to the CCP. Third, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement will enter into force for the Philippines on June 2nd of this year. This agreement was initiated by the 10 Asian countries in 2012 and officially signed in November 2020. Under the agreement, the Philippines' commitment to zero-tariff goods averages more than 90%, with the highest commitment to China at 91.3%, which is higher than the level of openness to other non-Asian members. Among them, the percentage of zero-tariff products immediately available to China is 80.5%, which is the highest level of immediate openness to China among all members of the agreement. These three elements show that the Philippine-China trade is more profitable for China. The CCP has been tantalizing the Philippines. For example, the Philippines was enticed to join the China-led Asian Investment Bank, or ADB. When the epidemic broke out, the ADB launched a U.S. 13 billion crisis recovery fund in April 2020, of which the Philippines has received U.S. 750 million in loans. This number is tiny compared to the massive need for development funds in the Philippines and the commitment made by the CCP. It can be said that the Philippines is one of the few countries in Southeast Asia that is not included in the economic track of China. The Chinese government has been luring the Philippines, but the latter hasn't really tasted much of the sweetness. The previous Philippine president, Rodrigo Dutre, adopted a pro-Beijing stance, particularly on the South China Sea, trying to minimize differences in the hope of bringing tangible economic benefits to the Philippines. This is despite Dutre's overtures to Beijing to downgrade relations with the U.S., leaving behind his victory in the Hog Court South China Sea arbitration. Instead, the harassment of Philippine vessels by Chinese maritime forces has intensified. Since last year, the Philippines has filed more than 200 diplomatic protests against the CCP, including at least 77 since Marcos Jr. took office in June. Perhaps Marcos Jr. witnessed all of this, realizing that backing down would not make the CCP's behavior any better, and therefore opting to deepen relations with Washington. The Philippines now has a trade deficit with China of nearly US 50 billion. The more the Chinese threaten the Philippines militarily then, the more it pushes the Philippines toward the US. The US is moving its markets as well as manufacturing and production bases to Southeast Asia. It can make up for the Philippines' economic shortfall. So now, the two countries are cooperating, which is beneficial to the Philippines both militarily and economically. And uh, we welcome you back. And, uh, you know, when we met in New York last year, you told me that, uh, that a strong alliance has to continue, quote, and this is your phrase, to evolve as we face the challenges of this new century. And we are facing new challenges. And I can't think of any better partner to have than you. I couldn't agree more that we have to, this relationship has to continue to evolve. And together, we're deepening our economic cooperation which is going to continue to deepen, I think, is mutually beneficial. And we're going to announce that, I'm shooting, we're going to announce today that I'm sending a first-of-its-kind presidential trade and investment mission to the Philippines. In recent years, one of the notable practices of the CCP has been to hound the Philippines from time to time not to follow the U.S. on the Taiwan Strait issue. The sudden Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 should have made the Philippines believe that war is actually not too far away. If war really breaks out in the Taiwan Strait, the 150,000 Filipino citizens working in Taiwan will be at risk. As if the CCP hadn't irritated the Philippines enough, its ambassador to the Philippines made a public threat after the Philippines opened four more bases to the U.S. 
He said that if the Philippines was concerned about the safety of its 150,000 workers in Taiwan, it should oppose Taiwan independence instead of opening its military bases adjacent to the Taiwan Strait to the U.S. This has triggered an outcry from various sectors in the Philippines. It's not hard to understand then that in May, Marcos Jr. approached the U.S. to step up its war preparations. The Philippine alliance with the U.S. will strengthen the military deterrence against the CCP in the South China Sea and the Bashi Channel, which will deter the CCP's attempts to use force and protect the safety of the Filipino people in Taiwan. In addition, if war breaks out in the Taiwan Strait, the Chinese Navy and Air Force will certainly cross the Bashi Channel to clash with the U.S. The Philippine Islands in the Bashi Channel may then be under attack and may even be taken over by the Chinese. The U.S.-Philippines has conducted a joint military exercise, especially on Bataan Island in the Bashi Channel, and may deploy the multiple launch rocket system here in the future to fight the Chinese warships crossing the Bashi Channel. Another major reason is that the long-standing, condescending attitude and bullying behavior of the CCP has become intolerable to the Philippine government and people. A poll conducted by Pulse Asia in late 2022 found that 84% of Filipinos believe that the Marcos Jr. government should cooperate with the U.S., while 52% of Filipinos believe that the Marcos government should also cooperate with Japan. This is the only way to truly defend Philippine sovereignty in the South China Sea. Military cooperation between the Philippines and the U.S. is rapidly escalating. The shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder military exercise ended in late April, followed by the Philippine U.S. Air Force's Code Thunder in May, which is the first time in 33 years that the exercise has returned to the Philippines. On May 10th, U.S. Army Chief of Staff James McConville met with his Philippine counterpart, Commanding General of the Philippine Army, Romeo Bronner Jr., in Manila during a one-day visit to strengthen the relationship between the two sides. Unlike the collective defense of NATO, the U.S. has five separate treaty allies in the Asia-Pacific region, Australia, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, and Thailand. As the CCP's threat of force in the Asia-Pacific region increases, Japan and Australia have signed separate defense agreements, and Australian troops appeared in the Philippines' military exercises in late April. In response to public opinion, the Marcos administration has not only aligned itself with the U.S., but also strung together a first island chain of anti-communist defenses with the U.S., Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Australia. This defense line is likely to develop into an Asian version of NATO in the future.